All right, so we are now in U.S. history two. This is post Reconstruction history, so from 1877 all the way to the modern era. The first unit, however, we're going to be discussing is going to be the industrialization immigration pattern that happened in the U.S. from the years of 1907 to 1900, and a little bit after 1900. All right, so first thing, here's our goal for this entire unit. We want to evaluate the influence of immigration and rapid industrialization on urban life. So two big things. we got to know what immigration and industrialization are. Immigration is fairly simple. It's when people from other countries come into our country. If they were going away from our country or leaving our country, we call that immigration, which is spelled with an E. So E means exit. Immigration is like importing. They're coming in here. Oh, sorry. And also industrialization. That means the basic technological factory work, the kind of development of cities as opposed to rural areas. So we used to be a very farming culture. Now we're becoming more of an urban culture based on production and factories instead of agriculture. All right, so first thing, we have to know who the new immigrants are and versus the old immigrants. All right, so new immigrants, they're from Eastern and Southern Europe. So you're talking about the what now we call it the old Soviet bloc countries, the countries that used to live under communist Russia, that area, Italians, Russians, Hungarians, Slavic countries, all those people, all those folks. Old immigration. These are the immigrants from Western and Northern Europe. These are the traditional, if you've ever seen the movie... Um, Gangs in New York, we're talking about Irish immigrants, English immigrants, a little bit of German immigration, some German immigration in there, Spanish, all these other places that are based in the northern part where England was during the what amounted to an English worldwide depression with all their colonies, so including Ireland, Scotland, they all started coming over here. Now, the different key, one key difference isn't just where they came from, it's the timing as well. So most of this new immigration that's from the 1890s into the early 20th century, old immigration, this is stuff that's been going on since the founding of our country. So since 1780, we've been having these immigrants from English-speaking predominantly countries coming over here. So immigration, immigrants from England, Ireland, Scotland, other countries that basically spoke our same language. So there's a little more commonality. All right, there's a quick map of just what we're talking about time frame-wise. So look, take a look at the different factors and different pull, pull, pushing and pull factors. This should be a little bit of review from world history, talking about push and pull factors for immigration. But pause here, take a look at it, write them down for your notes. All right, so this is the north. This is North and Western Europe. These are the old 1600s, 18, all the way to 1890s. This is where these guys are coming from. Coming so the Northwestern way up here, this area. And then you got the you got the new guys coming from Romania, Lithuania, Poland. These are more Eastern Bloc countries. This is the new immigration. Northwest over here, this is old immigration. Down here, this is all this new, all these new immigrants. All right, so the hammer at home: old immigrants, north and west; new immigrants, south and east. The continent of Europe. All right. Additionally, here's a quick graph, just kind of shows you a timeline of what's going on here. So take a look at the old immigrants from Western Europe. You don't see much going on with that, and that should be telling. You see this little, you see a spike in the 1880s, which is a big Irish immigration movement during that period of time. That's where you get that little bump, but it's pretty steady after that and before. Whereas what you're talking about with the new immigrants, at least the new immigrants from South, Southern, Southern and Eastern Europe, it spikes very hard in the right at the turn of the century in 1900, and that's when you get, a, and then you have a big drop off. Right around 1915, which is also co- which also coincides right in time with World War One, so that explains that drop off, and then it pops back up right when World War One ends. All right, so time frame wise, this is what we're looking at: just the numbers from 1820 to 1880. These are the old immigrants, the ones that are pointing out the German Empire. And, we, and the word German Empire is kind of misleading here. There was no country of Germany yet. This is basically a relatively new situation that it was like Austria, Hungary, all these various German-speaking cultures that hadn't conglomerated into a German country yet. So these are just German immigrants, German-speaking immigrants. Ireland, Britain, those are all your old immigrants. Then you have your new immigration coming up, coming up later. And there's our new immigrants, Italy, Austria, Hungarian Empire. Now, the Austro-Hungarian Empire is a, is a little weird because you think, oh, Hungary and Austria, well, they speak German. There's some German speaking in there. You're correct. 
but the empire itself was actually spread much further east. It took them a lot, like what's now Czechoslovakia and those places. They kind of took over like a lot of the Slavic countries as part of their quote unquote empire. The Russian Empire, German Empire you had some more, but the big three are Austria, Hungary, Italy, and Russia. And one thing you need to note about that is there's very little English going on here. This is they're they're coming over here, not able to speak any English at all. Whereas before you had immigrants from Great Britain, Ireland, they spoke English, so it wasn't that big a deal. Or at least it was it was a big deal, but it wasn't quite the culture shock. Alright, this is just an activity that's actually located in your book. But go ahead and take a look at it real fast. Pause it here. Answer the question. It's not terribly difficult. So obviously we can tell the 1900s had the largest surge of immigrants. So there you go. All right. New immigrants versus old immigrants. New immigrants dis- were disliked predominantly because of the culture they were bringing in. They were predominantly Catholic and Jewish. They were tend to be very, very poor because that's the one of the the pull the push factors coming over here is they're starving out there so they better get out get the heck out and try to go somewhere where they can be more prosperous they weren't well educated and they were often unskilled old immigrants were mostly protestant anglo-saxons so you're talking about again irish and english they tended to speak english there wasn't any language conflict they were mostly protestant so you're talking about at that point the anglican church or, or even in germany it was mostly gonna it was mostly people who were lutherans so not very many Catholics, not very many Jews. With this new influx of immigrants, a lot of Catholics and a lot of Jews, and it caused a great deal of conflict. And this is an immigrant town. I believe this is New York City, right around the turn of the century. All right, so I'm about to talk about Ellis Island and some major issues going on there. This is a quick picture. Of, like These are immigrants being examined in the top left corner. In the top right corner, you're seeing some Russian peasants. The peasant class in Russia was gigantic because it, ha- it hadn't been much more than 50 years since basically there were serfs. So we're way back in, think back to your world history review where you talked about, okay, we're going to have the serfs, the feudal system, all that stuff. But you think of that like the Middle Ages. Well, no, Russia kept that system in place for a long, long time. So these peasants were basically, when we say peasants, we're not talking about people who couldn't feed themselves or weren't able to work. These were borderline freed slaves as far as their ability to work, get education, have money. And then at the bottom, you have some Slavic immigrants. All right, so immigration and urbanization. The growth of cities due to the rise of industrialization, immigration, and people leaving their farms to find jobs in the cities. Typically, during this time period, and even since then, really, if you were someone who owns 300 acres of farmland in Virginia, and you have eight kids, which is fairly typical for back then, there's only one person that's going to inherit that farm. It's the firstborn son. So you had this issue where all these second and third born kids had no money and had no inheritance to work with. It was a way to keep like family land intact and not lose the value of the land by splitting it up among several children. The firstborn son gets it and leaves all these other guys kind of in the dust, whether or not they're going to be able to find farmland or buy their own own land with the money they make. And you eventually kind of run out of suitable land to work with. And farming isn't making the money it used to post-slavery. So now people are starting to move to the cities to find jobs. Because that is where the jobs are. That's where the factory work is located. So take a look at this. This is a really cool map. It actually breaks down, like just by some cases, by street. Where these little pockets of immigration are. And what's really crazy about this, if you were to take a map nowadays, that would account for the background of people, whether they're... German, Irish, Italian, Russian, Scandinavian background. The map wouldn't look that much different today. It would be a little more mixed in, but there's still these areas of New York that are basically, this is an Italian neighborhood, this is a Jewish neighborhood, this is a Russian neighborhood, this is an Irish neighborhood. It still very much exists to this day. All right, and here's the famous place, Ellis Island. This is the center for processing of all European immigrants. So we're talking about just the guys from Europe. And this is all coming to America through New York City during the 19th and early 20th centuries. It's no longer in service as a docking station for immigrants. But this place was in existence for a long time for the sole purpose of basically keeping track and going through and basically making sure that immigrants weren't sick, weren't sickly, that they were who they said they were, that kind of stuff. This is Ellis Island today. So this now basically, it's, it basically is an island museum. And you can see all kinds of really cool stuff there. Like you can see, like people didn't just 
come here and work because that would be a pain with the ferry system. People would actually live here. There were like working dorms where the workers would be. There were dorms where the people who were in quarantine would stay because sometimes they'd come over and they'd be suspected of having some terrible disease like tuberculosis. And then they put you in quarantine to either get get better or possibly die in quarantine. They took it very seriously, this idea of communicable diseases going back and forth across Ellis Island. They wanted to stop disease, bad people, all these people from coming in. So they really did check you a lot. Another strange story about Ellis Island. When you came to Ellis Island, you were often kind of robbed of your heritage in a way. Not like they'd tell you, all right, you're Christian now. They would basically, what they'd do is they'd say, all right, you have a strange name. It'd be like, let's say your name was, uh, let's say you're Greek. So you're one of these new immigrants from the Greek islands. And your name is Oligopolis, something very hard to pronounce for an American tongue at the time. They might look at you and go, all right, now your name is uh, Alex. Your name's Smith, or they change your last name for you. And that was actually a fairly common practice back in the day. And there's just some more pictures of the music itself. All right, now, there is an equivalent on the West Coast. It's called Angel Island. On the West Coast, this is where the Asian immigrants came over, and predominantly Asian immigrants came over in part to build the Transcontinental Railroad. That's the early uh, 19th century, so pre pre and post-Civil War. After that, they were coming here again for work. Asia was experiencing a major famine and just a whole lot of damage as a result of wars and uh, empire kind of stuff, people fighting, and just various things were pushing people out of Asia to come to America to work and get land, make money. All right, there you go. There's Lady Liberty. All right, this is the poem, The New Colossus by Emma, Emma Lazarus. Now, the famous portion is the one that's in quotes at the bottom, but this is the entire poem itself. So take a moment to pause the video, read it, and, ba- and reflect on what it's actually saying. Or we, it, it's a, And understand, this thing was put, people would see this as they were coming into Ellis Island. They go to Ellis Island, but it's in the same harbor. You can see Lady Liberty at the far end. And it was very much a pro-immigration kind of stance. So take a look, take a pause on this, read through it, Write down your own interpretation of the words, and I want you to tell me if people people nowadays, immigrants nowadays, they still look at this and feel the same way. Do you we still look at immigrants the same way that Emma Lazarus kind of put up, put immigrants up for us to look at? How, how did Emma Lazarus view immigration versus how do modern-day Americans view immigration? So write that down in your notes. All right, so now we have to talk about something that's inevitable when you have people from different cultures coming into contact with new people from different cultures. And we call the term culture shock. This is when language and cultural differences from new immigrants facing the new world are basically, they just clash with the existing society within that new place that they've chosen to live. And this little cartoon is just a great illustration of that, where you just have two completely different cultures viewing each other in almost identical ways. You have, in this on the right-hand side, you have someone who's obviously a Muslim woman wearing a full modesty garb, covering all of her body parts to show basically modesty. And then unless you have an obviously very Americanized Western woman wearing a bikini out in public like you sometimes do in places like Florida and, and during the summer. And they basically, they're thinking the exact same thing. Everything covered but her eyes. What a cruel male-dominated culture. And then it's this, yeah, they're both saying the same thing, but for different reasons. One, the woman's being objectified by that male-dominated culture. The other one, the woman's being forced to cover up by that male-dominated culture. It's the exact same argument for different reasons, and it's totally and completely based on the culture from which each woman in this case comes from. So culture shock was a big issue, and it's a big issue today, and it was a big issue back then, and the reason is still the same. It's immigration. Immigration leads to culture shock because typically people immigrate to a new country because life in the old country has become terrible or not worth living there for, and usually that means that something bad's happening and that life is very difficult. So when you come to this new country where life is typically better, the culture is often very different. Now, cultural plural, pluralism is the result of mass immigration, and it reduced the existence of major of a majority ethnicity. So this would be like um, if there's an ethnicity in the state of New York, it would it would more than likely be dominated by Protestants coming in and who would live there forever and ever since the colonial era. So Protestant Anglo-Saxon males with English heritage. So new immigrants come in. And now the majority that used to have, let's say, 80% of the population has had their majority cut down to, let's say, 55% of the population. The power of that majority ethnicity. That's a tough position that puts that old culture in where now we're losing numbers. We're no longer the biggest. We might no longer be the largest at all. And what typically happens eventually, the largest block that used to exist, let's say Anglo-Saxon Protestant males in New York, in New York 
now no longer have a majority because so many new immigrants come in from other cultures. Now, none of those new immigrants make up a majority, but all the immigrants taken together would be 60% of the population. And the old culture, that old Anglo-Saxon Protestant, that would be like 40%. So they no longer have a majority in the power. Now, they are still the pluralist power. They are the largest block of, of, ethnic, of ethnic groups, but they don't have majority power, and we're in a democracy. So not having the majority means you might not win the election and have your interests supported. So with immigration, we have to talk about two major theories for immigration. There's the melting pot theory, and we're about to talk about the salad bowl theory in the next slide. All right, so the melting pot theory is this belief that everyone in a group lends and blends into American culture. Don't worry about the video clip with Schoolhouse Rock. You can look it up on your own time. But basically it's this. When you come here, you kind of add your own little flair to the soup, but it still kind of tastes like the same soup. You don't really, like when an when a Irish person comes into America, yeah, you can tell they're Russian or, or they're Irish or they're Italian, but overall they become American. So it's, it's almost like an assimilation form. So assimilation means you become American when you move to America. Or if you were to immigrate to Russia, you would become Russian. That's assimilation. In our country, that usually means that you become American, you start going to baseball games, all that fun. You adopt American personas. You might still have a Russian accent. You might still practice your religion a certain way. You might still hang out with the Rus Russian people. But the idea is you become more American and kind of add to the soup or the melting pot. Think like fondue. Then there's the salad bowl theory. This is a newly developed kind of theory. It's not as old as the melting pot system. So this is a new development. So in a salad, think about a salad bowl. When you eat a salad, if you take a bite and it's lettuce and just some bacon bits, well, you got you can obviously taste the bacon bits. You can taste the lettuce. But there's also other things in salad, like tomatoes and everything else. If you don't get the tomato, you don't taste the tomato. It's not like a soup where all kinds end up tasting all the same and it kind of melts into itself. Under this theory, people come in but retain much of their same culture and language. So they might come in and their goal isn't to become American. It's to bring their own culture to this new place. And it kind of go, it goes into a lot of conflict when you're talking about this idea that at the time was very popular of assimilation. If you don't assimilate, we don't want you here. If you're subscribing to the salad bowl theory, there really isn't a whole lot of benefit to assimilating in with like the melting pot theory would have you so in the salad bowl theory they retain a lot more of their culture and the way they existed before they came here in the in the melting pot theory they kind of melt into what america is and become american now the result of all this all this immigration was a concept called nativism it centered around a belief that immigration had to be restricted leading group determination and immigration quotas. So nativism, we at some point it was called know-nothingism, like know-nothings were anti-immigrant. Basically, there were people that wanted to make sure that the quote-unquote native population, not Native Americans, but native people who lived here before the immigrants got here, that's who we're referring to. So don't get confused. If you see the term nativist, they're not talking about Native Americans. They're talking about white Anglo-Saxon males, I'm sorry, sorry, white Anglo-Saxons in general, usually Protestant, living in New England and the rest of America, being opposed to more new immigrants coming in from these Eastern European countries where there were different cultures, religion, and languages coming in. And they believed that these people coming in were actually, quote-unquote, polluting the native race. So it was a, one, it was a racist slash jingoist kind of belief, and it also would lead to a great deal of other strife for incoming immigrants. All right, this is an extremely famous political cartoon from quite a while ago. This is called Looking Backward. And the quote under there is, says, they would, they would close to the newcomer the bridge that carried them and their fathers over. So if you take a look at this very closely, if you can see in the video, zoom in, blow it up. You see a person who's obviously an immigrant coming across with basically everything he owns on his back. And then you see these wealthy people in their little top hats all saying, no, 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 don't let him over, don't let him over. But look at the shadows. Look at the shadows. And there's two interpretations of this. Some people say that the shadows in the back who look like very poor immigrants, people of immigrant backgrounds, all that stuff. Some people say, oh, those are them just 40, 50 years ago. Others interpret this as these are your ancestors that are back there. And now you're not letting this new group in that your great grandfather got the benefit of immigration. Why won't you let this new group come in to reap the same benefit? So basically, he's pointing out a hypocrisy of people who at the time were very anti-immigrant. All right, let's talk about the Chinese Exclusion Act. of was stretched from 1882 all the way to 1943. So we're into World War II by the time this Exclusionary Act is repealed. All right, this act was passed by Congress and prevented almost all legal immigration of Chinese immigrants 
from coming to America in 1882. It was renewed 10 years and not repealed until 1943. The first groups of immigrants to be banned from entering the U.S. Now, the reason for this was because they were basically very cheap labor, and there was a fear on the West Coast, certainly, and eventually would lead to the East, that they would come in and basically just take over land because there were so many immigrants coming in for, for a period of time, specifically to build the Transcontinental Railroad. These are these are Chinese districts in California, like Chinatowns, that kind of, those kind of places. They actually were established by Chinese immigrants decades and decades ago. And this is a very famous blue cartoon, the Wasp. Now, this is the whole. Um, if you ever uh, heard the little kids' poem slash story, like if you give a mouse a cookie, this is like if you give a mouse a cookie but racist against Chinese people. So this is like give a tiger a cookie, what happens? Well, they're like, oh, okay, we can be nice to these little. Chinese immigrants, and then this little kitten over here, and then it gets a little bigger, and then it's knocking you down, and then it's bowling you over, and this Chinese tiger, the tiger became kind of a synonym for the Chinese immigration crisis during this time, or the supposed Chinese immigration crisis at the time. You notice he has a stereotypical Chinese hat on from that period. Then the tenor of this is it's an anti-immigration political cartoon against the Chinese. So this was just one of many other examples of propaganda that basically make people think that Chinese immigrants were a bad thing to come in. All right, so on to more about urbanization and industrialization. So why are these immigrants coming over? Well, because there's work. The work is industrial. We're not talking about very, there's very few immigrants in history that come over and then start traveling and go farming. Most of them come in unskilled, meaning they have to come in, do factory work. Most factory work is unskilled labor. Now, the first example of sweatshops pop up in this time period. So you set, this is where you have people just working in terrible conditions, and they call them sweatshops in part because that you are sweating. There's no AC. The windows are too small. A lot of these machines run on electricity powered by coal, and it, just, it makes the air dirty. It's just a nasty situation. And often these kind of sweatshops were the targets of progressive movements that popped up during this time period. This is a very famous city studies kind of issue. If you're ever in a class that studies urbanization or cities, you are going to talk about the dumbbell tenement. A tenement is basically a, we also call them boarding houses, places where people can live. Um, around North Carolina, if you think about like migrant camps where the migrant where migrant workers live for a period of time when the harvest is coming up, it's kind of like that. But this is a dumbbell tenement. This is an actual layout of how you would live in this period. So notice the public hall down the middle. This is all public. These public halls lead to your bedrooms. You'd have some bedrooms right here, and they lead right from this public hallway. So you would have an open door to your bedroom in a public hallway. Tons of fun. You'd also have a, a common living room and living area and parlor. And these aren't very large, guys. You're talking about 10 by, I want to say, you got 50 feet here. 50, you're talking about maybe a few hundred square feet. It's very, very small. These tenement houses would often have dozens of people in them. Like one bedroom would hold several people probably way more than you would expect at the whole. And you'll see some images coming up of the, of some of these bedrooms in these tenement houses. And this, if you want to pause here and read the uh, little street marker, this is just a famous tenement house on Orchard Street. You've seen this picture already, but this is why you have tenement houses right here, guys. You eventually couldn't build anymore, so you had to like just kind of pack people in. There's a huge population boom, and you got to find a place for these people to sleep. And usually what would, you ha- what would happen? You, If you're a owner of property you want to make as much money as possible so you pack as many people into these little tenement houses as you can charge them rent you don't fix anything don't offer any amenities no obviously no air conditioning you might not even have a bathroom in the building that kind of stuff but and that's where slums come from and slum lords begin to exist this is just one bedroom in a tenement house and one bedroom would hold a family we're not talking about a bedroom for a person and one family would live on a wing in a tenement dumbbell style house this would be like a whole family just in this room. And this guy right here, Jacob Rees, he wrote a muckraking book. And look up the term muckraking. It's good to have in your vocabulary, so make sure you take the time to look up that term muckraking, what it means. It was a book on the plight of urban immigrants. So a lot of this, and it was called How the Other Half Lives. Now, the reason why it got that title, it was a photographic journalism kind of piece. So they would take these terrible, terrible pictures of these immigrants living in these horrible conditions. And the reason for this was there was no news. There was no 24-hour news at the time. There was no internet. There was no way to just walk around. There, newspapers weren't produced as easily as they are now. 
you couldn't get information out there. And the people that Reese was trying to reach was not immigrants. Immigrants knew how bad their lives were. They weren't, and they weren't buying his stuff. The, what who he was trying to show was the wealthy. And that title of that book, "How the Other Half Lives," is how the poor live. It's basically saying, "Hey, rich folks, you people who think life's so great, this is how the other half lives." It's not. It's like quite. It's a very literal title, it's saying this is how the other half of the world that you don't see every day lives. Because for the most part, if you were wealthy, you would never see this. You didn't see these industrial portions of the city. You got to see like the parks and the pretty areas and the shops. You didn't get to see where people would literally die in the street and no one would pick up their body, that kind of stuff. And these, this is a typical tenement house. This is a photo from Jacob Rees, How the Other Half Lives. And you notice, you'll see, I'm counting one, two, three, four, five, possibly six people if that's another leg down that left corner, or sorry, that right, that right corner. You're talking about a lot of people in a very small, small area. Terrible, terrible way to live. So we have what's called settlement houses. This is part of the progressive movement that is a direct corollary to the industrial movement. So we have this industrialization, this raising of factories, and this industrial labor of unskilled workers and immigrants coming in, and they're poor, and they have no place to live, and they're not given very many options, and they're living in nasty conditions. This was one of the first attempts to kind of fix that. These were often like have someone who was a very pro advancement of immigrants kind of person. We call them progressives. People who want to create progress for everybody, including these immigrants. They would live in these houses and provide assistance to immigrants from these. They were like little bases of operation for them to go out and help immigrants in the area. A very famous person, a very famous house she provided was Jane Addams. She was a social progressive, meaning that she wanted to engage in societal progress through philanthropy and donation and charity. And the founder of Hull House was a settlement house for immigrants in 1889, and it catered a great deal to children. Like, she was there to educate them, provide them clean water, clean living, that kind of stuff. Basically, take care of immigrants who weren't being taken care of and couldn't take care of themselves in many cases. All right, guys, and this is a very quick example of what Hull House would do. This is just one example. It wasn't just about, like, you know, giving food and soup to the poor immigrants and making sure that they're, like, little like the little kids who are orphaned, little kids who just couldn't be taken care of, had, like, a nice clean crib to sleep. It was also about distracting like a lot of the kids. So you see there it says kindergarten games and a maypole dance. Like just things it was just to say, hey, there's more than just going to work at a factory 15 hours a day. It, like the air is warm. The skies are clear. Birds and blossoms all are here. Come old and young with spirits gay to welcome back the charming May. Basically, just it's a distraction. They're trying to make life better for these people in more than just food and shelter kind of ways they're trying to make hey life is great go have fun and play that kind of stuff so the whole house was a very progressive oriented kind of kind of movement and the those sediment houses in, in any case were all kind of of this ilk they all kind of did the same things brought a band and music and just recreation for people who otherwise just wouldn't have it they did, couldn't afford to go do a lot of stuff now that being said one of the biggest lifestyle changes during this time period because you have this sudden influx of people coming to cities, not just immigrants, but people coming from the farm country to move to the cities where the work exists. These guys are coming here, and they don't have much leisure. They don't have many options, so you start seeing spectator sports pop up. It used to be that sports and participating in sports, whether it was horse racing or any real activity, like you participated in it. Like part of the fun was you got to go do it. Now we're actually going to watch sports. So baseball was the big one. So baseball clubs started popping up. That's why baseball to this day, the really the brass ring of baseball is located in New England. That's where so much baseball is so important. You, you have it spread out since then, obviously. It's America's pastime, all that stuff. But man, in New England, an industrial area like the Chicago area and the Cubs and the, and the White Sox, and you got New York and New England, the Boston, all the various ball clubs up there. They, this all came out of the Industrial Revolution because people wanted to do something on their day off or on their hours off that wasn't just like, you know, staring inside their tenement house where the walls are drab and everything looks terrible. A new thing also came up called the electric, the electric trolley. This is a byproduct of urban growth because people had to get around and not everybody could afford a car. Not everybody could even afford a good bike. I mean, you're talking, and they filled a need for the growth of transportation and people who lived in the suburbs could now quickly get to the city. So it's more than just these the, the poor folks working in the city getting around. Now the rich folk don't have to live near the poor folk anymore because they can get in and out of the city easily. This is 
there's a term used out there it's that's a byproduct of white racism called white flight where the white folks all leave the city and the people who are left are minority groups this is like wealth flight so all of a sudden the wealthy who have enough money can now go and leave the nasty city areas and go live in the country where it's green and pretty and then just come into work every day on these electric trolleys. So it kind of, it exacerbated an issue in the urban areas that was already bad, which is just the poverty and the lack of sanitation and everything else, and just made it worse because then all the wealthy people all just left to go to the suburbs. You also start seeing amusement parks pop up. This is where urban workers could go to like have a beer and buy some cotton candy and go on the cyclone and all this other stuff like Coney Island. All these various places are popping up where the sole purpose was to amuse people, to distract them from the fact that they had a hard day and they had a hard one coming up and once they woke up from their night's sleep. This is kind of what, this was, again, more distraction, but it was like pleasant distraction. Ferris wheels, um, guessing a person's weight, kissing booths, all these things were popping up during this time. Roller coasters, all byproducts of this industrial revolution in this industrial age where people can suddenly congregate in large areas where they used to be much more spread out. Frederick Law Olmsted, probably the most famous person in landscaping, which is a very strange thing to say. Someone who's very famous for their landscaping ability, not not physical moving of dirt. This guy has a really cool history. He designed numerous parks, but the most famous one he designed is New York City. And he's this weird guy. He's actually the son of a very very out of a very very wealthy family. And one thing he did when he was in his early twenties, he's like, you know, uh, I don't want to get a job right now. And he just goes to Europe and just travels. And he's not traveling to, like, go meet women and go buy stuff. He's traveling and just, I'm sure he met women and bought stuff, but that wasn't the main purpose. The purpose for him was just going and looking at nature. He was just going around, and one of the really cool things he wanted to focus on wasn't just this idea of, well, let's make a park. Let's make it all grass and green and everything. He wanted to make sure his parks kind of used real terrain in a way that made it seem natural. He wanted you to walk into a park and not think that you were walking into something that was designed to be a park. Like Central Park, if you ever go to it, it's very natural. The hills feel very, very normal and natural, and everything looks very nature and orient. It's not like, okay, somebody put a tree here, somebody put some dirt there and put grass on top of it. Like you just see, like you walk through, and like, oh, this is how it's supposed to look, and there's just a pathway that someone put here. It, look, it doesn't look like somebody put a park there. It looks like somebody put a path through what is natural foliage. It's very, it meant to be very natural during this time, and it's very almost, a, I guess, a humanist kind of way to look at parks. And that's what it looks like today. So you see the little spots where they have little playground areas, but for the most part, it's just trees and nature paths and everything else. So it was, it was designed very much to be this natural area in the middle of all this concrete. And you also have a man named Alexander Graham Bell. He invented the telephone. And this facilitated business transaction led to more employment of a lot of women who would basically be the, think like if you watch an old style cartoon, someone like cranks the old style phone and they say operator. Well, that operator nine times out of ten is female and they connect you directly with an actual like phone jack into a wall that connects you directly to that person. Here's Bell in an early telephone. And you'd actually crank it. That crank would send an electrical sim- s- signal out, and the operator on the other end would know to answer the phone and then plug you in directly into another line that would direct into the next phone down the down the way, miles away possibly, connected by wire. That phone would then ring, and you'd answer it, and you'd be connected. Now, the funky thing about these phones is that early, early ones, anybody could access the line. So anybody could tap into a line and be able to hear all the conversations. So the phone was, like, invented, and all of a sudden... There was a lot of spy stuff going on, like especially with with um, the telegraph movement. So it was very easy back in the day with a telegraph and the telephone to just tap into a line, and you could hear everything. Every conversation was happening on those. And then, of course, the probably most famous, the inventor Thomas Edison, did they say invented the light bulb? He perfected the light bulb. The light bulb existed, but what he invented was the filament or that little piece of wire in between it that lasted long enough to be functional. Like early on, like photographs, they could use, they would use um, filaments, but they'd explode half the time. He basically used uh, I believe it was carbonized cardboard, so burnt up cardboard as the filament. And it actually would light up a lot better and would stay lit for a long, long time. And once you got the light taken care of, darkness wasn't an issue. So business, like it used to be back in the day, there, um, and I say back in the day, I mean like the 1700s, everything was lit by candle. They didn't have gas lamps. And it was actually a sleep pattern back during that time period. You would go to bed at like five in certain times in certain parts of the country because that's when it got dark. Once it got dark, you shouldn't be outside. It's not safe anymore. 
So they'd go to sleep at 5. They'd wake up around 11 o'clock, stay up for an hour or two, read a book, read part of a book. And then they'd go back to bed again and wake up around 6 or 7 the next morning because that gap was there. It was such a long time to be asleep. Well, after gas lamps and the electric light bulb, boom, no more reason for that anymore. So you also see things with Edison like the Edison film works. You start seeing pic- moving pictures happen. All this is changing the modern world. Like things in modern life that we just take for granted, Edison played a big part in making sure that they were out there. Now, he's also kind of a jerk in real life, and we'll discuss it later on in class. If, and you might get the chance in my class to watch um, the series Men Who Built America. kind of explains the the guy Edison really was. All right, Christopher Scholes. He invented the typewriter. And this is another one of those inventions that basically improves or at least increases the role of women in the workforce. So where the work used to be dominated by mostly men, the typewriter is one of these activities. Well, women can't always lift a 100-pound sack over their shoulder and walk it down to a portion of the factory or mine coal or press on a big factory uh, plant and make sure that steel gets poured into a frame and mold correctly. That's not considered women's work, and they might not be able to do it, depending on how old they are, if they got too many kids, or if they, or if they're just not physically able to do it. Well, guess what? Typing doesn't require a lot of strength, but it does require that you be able to read and write in a certain way. And women typically had more education even back then than men did, because men did the hard labor. So women got more of a role in the workforce because the typewriter made it possible for them to do more secretarial work that used to be done by hand. And then you got a guy named Elisha Otis. This guy made the modern building. Now, he didn't make a building, and he didn't even invent the elevator. But if you look at a lot of elevators nowadays, if you look down at the bottom where you see that little label, a lot of them will be labeled Otis. That's the Otis company named after this guy, Elisha Otis. Again, didn't invent the elevator. He actually invented the emergency and safety brakes that made it so that if the elevator cable snapped, you wouldn't die when, when it fell down. You might get hurt pretty bad, but you wouldn't die. Now, basically, this led to the ability for... P- or, um, it, what used to be an expensive apartment was the bottom floor because it meant you didn't need any sta- you didn't have to climb any stairs because the only safe way to get up to the top floor was through stairs. So the top floor apartments before Elisha Otis, they were the cheapest ones. It was like the nosebleeds. If you lived on an eighth floor apartment, your life sucked because you had to walk up eight flights of stairs every single day to get down to the bathroom, to get down to where your kids might go to school, to get down to where your work is. And then you got to walk all the way back up every time you want to go to your house and room. Lash Otis changed that because once the elevator got invented, all of a sudden, the bottom floor is the worst floor to live on. You just take the elevator to the top one now. And the top one has the better views. It has You don't have to smell what's on the ground. And this is back during a time where horse travel was still very common. And there was horse feces all over the place and people stank and everything else. And you wouldn't smell all that. You would just smell crisp, clean air and you'd be up high and you could just look at everybody, all the little people down below. And you, and on top of that, you wouldn't be dealing with stairs anymore. So this guy right here basically changed the way cities was, were even designed. 